skills for students with learning disabilities. A couple of housekeeping matters first. Um, everyone participating in the webinar is in listen-only mode. We do welcome questions, however, and we invite you to type them into the chat window. My colleague, Dr. Sarah Sautel, is going to be monitoring those and letting me know of questions as we go along and at the end. Um, we'll also open up the chat to public chat um, about three quarters of the way through the presentation. Um, we are also happy to share the slides from this presentation. So anyone who is attending today and who provided their information, the contact information when they logged in, will automatically get a copy. If you're not sure whether you did or whether you probably didn't um, or you think you didn't, I'm going to be providing my contact information, my email address at the end, and you can just email me to request a copy. And there are a variety of other resources so um, that I'm going to be talking about. And all you have to do is just ask, and we're happy to share all of that stuff with you. Um, one of those things also is a certificate of participation. Some of those who are participating today may wish to have a certificate saying that they um, uh, what, participate in this webinar for um, professional development credit. And um, again, you can, um, we're going to be providing that information at the end as well. The session is being recorded today, right, Sarah? It sure is. Okay, terrific. Um, so it will be accessible later, usually within a day or two. And so if you have colleagues who couldn't make it today or you decide you want to share it with somebody later, you will have that ability. So for anybody who has participated in our webinars before, welcome back. And for those who this is your first one, we're just really thrilled to have you with us today. And we hope you find the information today useful and thought-provoking. So without further ado, um, I always like to start sort of getting a little, doing a little level setting and getting us all on the same, uh, focus on the same landscape. So I asked the question, what do learning disabilities look like? And I think many of us probably have a similar mental model that we think is sort of typical. And it might look something like this, a child who struggles with academic work and as a result also probably struggles with social esteem and other aspects of life. And um, in fact, I remember growing up that a lot of people didn't want to talk about learning disabilities. It was sort of a um, something that people didn't really want to admit to or didn't want to uh, talk about a lot. But in fact, there's been a, a lot more discussion, people are a lot more open it today. And in fact, um, this is the face of learning disabilities in some respects today. All of these celebrities, um, Anderson Cooper, Whoopi Goldberg, uh, James Edward Almos and um, Steven Spielberg all have learning disabilities. And um, while they may have struggled with them, of course, um, have been highly, highly successful today. Um, in fact, looking at someone with learning disabilities is sort of like looking in the mirror. Uh, it might look like any of us. And as we'll be discussing this afternoon, all of us have cognitive strengths and weaknesses, and that's really what learning disabilities are all about. Um, and for some of us, those weak areas really get in the way of learning and in learning the way that others learn in school. And, and that's where really the problem arises. And so we're going to look in, into that. Um, I'd also like to learn a little bit more about those participating in the webinar today. Um, I think it's also for all of you participating in the webinar to know sort of why we're all here. Um, so Sarah is going to launch a poll. And so please select your main reason. And we have um, four. Uh, so many of you probably work with students with learning disabilities. Some of you might be parents of a child with a learning disability. Some of you might have learning disabilities yourself. And some of you may be here because more than one of the above is true. Um, and so I'm going to choose mine. I'm going to choose mine. I'm going to pick one. And I'm going to submit my answer. Oh, I'm not allowed to pick. Well, that's because you launched the poll. Man. If I, if I go to the, if you go to the poll tab, which is next to the chat tab, you're going to be able to see the results. And what I'm saying is that the majority of um, those attending today are here because they work with students with learning disabilities, but a large uh chunk, almost a quarter of the people are here because there's more than one of the above. 
And I find that that's very common, actually, as we talked with and work with people who work with students with learning disabilities. Many of them um, have experience personally uh, with a child, with a close family relative, with themselves, um, also with learning disabilities. And so this is something that is familiar territory to many of this. So I want to really, really thank everybody for sharing that um, with us. I think we have a pretty good response here, so we could probably end the poll, Sarah. Um, and um, uh, again, about three quarters to one quarter, um, and many a number of parents here. So welcome to everybody. Um, hopefully, again, you will find this to be helpful and um, you know, provide some insights maybe that that you haven't had before. I so. Do also before you, before you get really into it, I do want to tell people that I am here. I will be online. Um, and if you have any question or comment that you want to make privately um, before we open it up for public, I'd be happy to respond or even bring up that question to Betsy uh, if it's something about what she's talking about. So don't forget about that chat window as you're listening. Anything that comes to mind, don't worry. No one can see it until we open it for public. Okay, and we'll let you know about that later. Okay, so this is our plan for this afternoon. Uh, we're going to talk, of course, about learning disabilities. Um, I always like to, as, uh, those of you who know me know, to start with some facts and figures, and then we're going to talk about cognitive skills and how cognitive skills and academic skills fit together. Um, and then we'll talk about interventions for students with learning disabilities and uh, what the what the gap has been, and talk about then the role of remediation of cognitive skills in helping students with learning disabilities. Um, and that's that's our plan for this afternoon. So um, many of you are more than familiar with this, um, but I did want to share it for those of you. We, we've got a variety of experience here, so this, some of this may be review for some of you. Um, if it is review for you, you can feel free to steal my slides so you don't have to recreate them when you do your presentations. Um, and uh, for those of you who haven't before, then um, you're going to have this background. So, of course, um, the, the definition of learning disabilities that, that most of us are familiar with and that we use a lot comes from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, which is the federal legislation that established um, what most of us um, are, go by. And it really talks about specific learning disabilities is the term that's used and relates them to disorders or deficits in underlying psychological processes. And that really means cognitive processes. It's another word for that. So we're going to come back to those cognitive processes in, in just a moment. Um, this is some statistics on the prevalence of um, learning disabilities. Um, a little over 5% of students in schools nationally have been diagnosed with a specific learning disability. That's a little over 40% of the special ed population in the country. Um, and there's actually a fairly wide variation in how children are classified from state to state. Um, uh, the over 60% of the special ed population in Louisiana and less than 20% in Kentucky. But nonetheless, it is still the case that specific learning disabilities or what we um, now, of course, per that definition, understand our deficits in cognitive processes still account for the largest group of special ed students that we are dealing with. Um, of course, it goes without saying that students with learning disabilities don't perform as well academically. And that's not a surprise. But I always like to put the real data into my presentations. Um, this disparity is really obvious. But what really strikes me about these data, this is from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, um, which is the federal data, of course. And um, this is from 2013. But And what you're seeing here, of course, is this isn't as clear as I would like. And if you, if you take your screen and you um, click on the full screen, it'll be a little bit larger and you'll be able to see it a little bit better. Um, so you're seeing the um, students with learning disabilities compared to the students without dif disabilities. And you're seeing here, these are below basic the, in the orange, basic in the dark blue, and proficient in advanced 
advanced in the lighter blue categories. And obviously, the students with disabilities are performing substantially below, with most of them below basic in all of the categories of reading and math and at fourth grade and eighth grade, sort of across the board. Um, and it's not so much the disparity, that, that which is so obvious from here, but if you looked at this in 2013 or you looked at it in any of the previous years for which this is reported, it doesn't really matter. Nothing much has changed. As a nation, all of our IEPs and 504s, our individualized education plans, are just really not having a huge impact on uh, or getting the job done in terms of helping our students with learning disabilities. Uh, perform academically the way that the rest of the population is. And it's a really tough job. And I believe that a lot of this has to do that we're just only really starting to understand what the job is. So why is the job so hard? Um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we're really only beginning to understand how the human brain learns and what happens when the underlying cognitive processes aren't working as they need to be. So here's what I mean. If you read the most recent report of the Learning Disabilities Association, which is actually a very helpful report, and it's one of those resources that I'm happy to send you a copy of if you don't have it already. Um, and it talks, it obviously sets out the, the basic types, the common types of learning disabilities. Um, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia, um, which are very fancy words, and all it really means is trouble with reading, trouble with math, and trouble with writing. And since the basics of, of academics and of school are reading, math, and writing, then having trouble with reading and having trouble with math and having trouble with writing would seem to be pretty logical learning disabilities. And the trouble with these troubles is that there's no reading part of the brain, there's no math part of the brain, there's no writing part of the brain. To understand what's happening, we have to dig down deeper. To read or write or do math, we have to engage a number of different cognitive processes, and they all have to be working together. So now we're going to look at the other side here, which are what we what are called um, cognitive deficits and disorders that are associated with these types of learning disabilities. And we see things like auditory processing or visual processing deficits, executive function deficits, attention deficits, uh, sh short term memory, processing speed deficits. And of course, none of these have the words reading or math attached to them or writing. Um, they are things that affect many academic processes, but they aren't really about the academic processes at all. And I think that's going to become even clearer later. So if we look at um, the kinds of, you know, uh, strategies that we as educators and our education system formally have recognized um, that the kinds of things that we need to help do to help students with learning disabilities um, when they have these deficits that impede their ability to learn and write and do math, um, these are the kinds of strategies that have been developed. Um, they fall into three main categories. Uh, we modify the curriculum, so we teach and we reteach, or we break it down, or we teach less. Uh, we accommodate. We accommodate by giving students additional time, or we provide aids to help with taking notes, or we read instructions, instructions out loud, and those kinds of things. And we teach students compensatory strategies. Um, the truth of the matter is, of course, that we all compensate for things we're not as good at. But with students with learning disabilities, um, they're not going to be able to learn without someone explicitly helping them understand and develop these strategies um, to stay organized, to use mnemonics, um, to use other devices, um, graphic organizers, and all those kinds of things. So these are of course, the standard, and those of you who are involved in special ed, this probably seems very obvious to you, but I do want to sort of review it for a reason because it, it does make um, a really important point because there is a strategy that is not in, in listed in this list. And in fact, what these current strategies do, what's important to understand about them, is that their purpose is really to bypass the cognitive processes that are weak 
in students with specific learning disabilities and to minimize the impact of their processing deficits. And that makes a certain amount of sense. There's a certain amount of logic there. If I have a weak process and I still need the student to be able to do something, I'm going to help them not have to depend on that process and thereby hopefully get them to be able to do whatever that thing is. So if a student has poor working memory and can't remember a set of instructions, I'm going to eliminate the need for the student to remember that list of things. So instead of saying, Johnny, take out your pencil, open the test booklet, and write your name at the top, I will say instead, Johnny, take out your pencil. And then I will wait for Johnny to take out his pencil. And then I will say, Johnny, take out, open your test booklet. And I will wait for Johnny to open his test booklet. So the question is that we're going to be addressing today and answering with some research for the rest of the afternoon is, if not the rest of the afternoon, the rest of our hour together, is if there isn't another approach. Isn't there, I mean, we could, I could take the afternoon, but um, isn't there a way that we can actually target those underlying processes and help the child develop them to the point that they can use them instead of bypassing them? Okay. So now we want to talk about what these cognitive processes are. Instead of be reasoning back from the academic processes, now what we're going to do is to take a look at a cognitive processing model that I think will help us um, a little more systematically um, look at what these underlying processes are. This is the conceptual model. It's, of course, it's not a diagram of how information flows in the brain. Um, I'm going to leave that work to the President's Brain Initiative. Uh, but here, it's really a, a sort of simplified way of, of thinking about how things work. So over on the left-hand side is input. This is where information comes into our brains from the outside world it, through our senses, through our vision, through our hearing, through our taste, smell, all the rest of it. That's the process of reception. So that's where this little box is here called reception. And basic processes at this stage include attending and screening and selecting information. These are processes that we're really not aware of most of the time when they're, they happen non-consciously. At the next stage, perception, that's where we start to give information that gets through our screening processes, that gets through the reception processes. We start to give that meaning. Um, we, can, we categorize things. So we start to identify and recognize things. And at this stage, processing is still pretty much non-conscious. Processing only becomes conscious at the next stage, and this is called direction, is what this box says here. And this is where the directive capacities of our mind kick in. This is where we actively hold on to and manipulate information. And this leads to our ability to create some kind of output from our thinking. And thinking, of course, is this last box. This is where we decide, we plan, we create, we, uh, we reason. And all of these functions, um, you know, we create all kinds of things. I had a wonderful list here. We create a sonnet, a song, a sermon, or a soundbite. Um, so all of those things are, are examples of output that come out of all of this process, from things coming into our brains and being processed in a variety of ways. And all of this depends at various stages going back and forth with um, the memory processes in our brains, which include everything from very short-term sensory memory to working memory to long-term memory, storing, retrieving it, connecting, and feeding it back and forth into each of these processes as we go. Now, this is all sounds pretty theoretical. And so what I did then was superimpose on top of this and it looks way cooler in my slide because it is sort of superimposed and you can see those boxes in the background. It's not, it doesn't look as good as I, as I wanted it to here, but you can just have to imagine. Um, the actual, um, cognitive skills themselves that people are often more familiar with rather than just the concepts of the processing. So, um, and these really connect back to some of those processing weaknesses that we talked about when we were talking about learning disabilities. So, for example, deficits in reception and perception processes involve problems with attention skills, like sustained attention, selective attention, flexible attention. 
also involve issues with things like visual and auditory discrimination or visual and auditory figure ground. Actually, this slide is a great example of a problem with visual figure ground because <laughs> <laughs> uh, separating the, um, the, the words that you're trying to read from the background could be a problem for some people. Um, directionality, distance, sequential processing, processing speed, all of these are foundational cognitive skills that happen non-consciously in thousands of a second for the most part um, that we um, need to process these things at this, these very initial stages of learning. Uh, and then we get to executive functions, higher order executive functions, um, uh, where we do get to things that are more um, more conscious. One of the issues with these foundational cognitive skills is they're pretty tricky because they are non-conscious. And since you joined this webinar, your the the parts of your brain that engage in this kind of processing, your reticular activating system, which is your attention system, your visual processing system, which is in the back of your brain in your occipital lobe, your ability to process and pace yourself, to distinguish sounds, your visual cues, all of these things have been going on without your being aware of them, any more than you've been aware of there being oxygen in the room for you to breathe. Um, at least for most of you. And if something isn't working well with one of these or more of these systems, unfortunately, I can't explain to you how to improve it. I can't explain to you how to take in more information at a glance or keep things in the right order in your brain in thousands of a second or distinguish sounds or visual information from background noise. But it turns out that I can train your brain with the right kind of exercise to do those things better. The same is true of executive functions. The same is true of memory functions. And getting a lot of attention these days are executive functions, and for very good reason. These processes, working memory, inhibitory control, and cognitive flexibility, are highly predictive of academic success. And this is true, of course, not just for students with learning disabilities, but for, for everybody. Working memory refers to our, and then again, this may be a review for some of you, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page on this. Working memory is our ability to hold information in our mind while we manipulate it. Inhibitory control, pretty much what it sounds like, it's what I do when I stop myself from punching somebody in the nose when I get angry at them, but it's also what I do over the longer term when I defer gratification. And cognitive flexibility is the ability to change my mindset when the rules of the world around me change. So when I learn that the world is not flat but round, a lot of other things change, and that is cognitive flexibility. Okay, so I always like to do examples. I like everybody to have, you know, some of us are familiar with these uh, terms. Um, some of you may be. Some of you uh, may be fairly new to this, and I always I know that there's nothing like exper experiencing this firsthand to really understand it. Um, and for those of you who work with others who may not be as familiar with these terms, these are fun exercises, I think, to use with others as you're trying to explain them and get them to understand why it is so important and why what the problem is when the students you work with struggle with these. So we're going to have a little working memory experience for the next couple of minutes. So on the next slide, you're going to be presented with a string of letters and numbers, and you're going to have seven seconds to learn them. You ready? Yep. Okay. Here we go. Okay, I think that was more like eight seconds. So, does anybody remember those? I so don't see think if it's you can. That I know the trick. So see if you can write them down <laughs> or say to them. I think you could do it without the trick there. <laughs> Probably. So, so if you said seven four B eight five F, you were correct. Good job, everybody. Woohoo! We did it. Remember a list of six things. And what I can tell you is that a normal adult has a working capacity, a memory capacity of about seven things, 
plus or minus two. So we would expect most of us on the call to remember that list. Um, our students might be a different story. Now, we're going to try another example. And this time I'm going to make it sort of easier. Um, all you have to do this time is to copy something down on a piece of paper. So the scenario is this. Um, your students in the classroom and the, the, your teacher has written a list of assignments on the board. And you're going to have a little bit of time here. Just a minute, I've got to get my stopwatch out. Okay. Um, to copy down the assignments. So, um, here you go. Here's your assignment list. Okay, students, you should be uh, pretty close to done by now. Oops. Okay. So I lied. I didn't make it easier. Um, <laughs> in fact, I made it pretty hard um, to try to give you experience of what it would be like to try to copy your assignment down from the board at school if you really had um, fairly limited working memory and perhaps some other cognitive processing problems. So now I am actually going to go back to um, the list. So what I did was, of course, item one has a bunch of unrelated items. It would require the average person two or three glances to retain the information, not just one glance. You can't glance up at that and remember it. Um, two, item two, of course, reads like what it would for someone with dyslexia or some kind of visual processing problems might experience it. Item three has um, a term that's unlikely to be familiar to, um, to really? any of us. <laughs> and so it would take most of people longer to write it down. For anyone who, who's interested, L-methylfolate is the precursor to serotonin, uh, which is a neurotransmitter. So it's one of those wonderful neuro chemicals that helps our neurons in our brains talk to each other. And of course, the last one, well, not of course, but the last one is written in French. It just says, research the life of Madame Marie Curie. Wow, uh, I guessed right. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I apologize, first of all, uh, and, it, and it wasn't really fair. And if you feel stressed, um, take a deep breath and um, think out loud about how you're going to try this out on your unsuspecting colleagues. So um, the point being, um, working memory is just, of course, even in a simple task, a seemingly simple task like copying an assignment down from a board um, if you uh, is just integral to, to doing something as basic as that. And of course, the impact of cognitive processes doesn't stop at copying assignments down from the board. They are just woven into the very fabric of uh, reading and math and everything else we've been talking about. Um, and I actually didn't even give you enough time on that other assignment. So anyway, OK. So let's talk about reading and math a little more, more depth. If you ask teachers what the basics of reading are, you're likely to hear something like decoding and fluency and comprehension. And indeed, these are all critical skills. We can't be good readers without having them. But they're not the most basic. Um, if you think about decoding, um, I can't be a good decoder unless I can sustain my attention. If I don't have the good visual discrimination so that I can distinguish very quickly between a B and a P or an M and an N, um, auditorily as well, um, if I can't keep letters in the right order or words in the right order when they come into my brain, if they get jumbled around, obviously those are going to impact decoding. Uh, when it comes to fluency, things like visual span, which is how much information I can take it at a glance. If I have greater visual span, my fluency is going to be greater. If it's less, it's going to be less. 
flexible attention is how fluently I shift my attention from one word to the next or one line to the next. Uh, processing speed is obviously going to impact it there. And comprehension is where the rubber really meets the road. Um, and again, I'm going to pick on working memory because it's just it's um, it's fairly easy actually to describe and to um, have people understand what an important role it plays. So um, we do a pretty good job in general in education of getting people to decode and to be fairly fluent and read out loud. But there's so many examples, um, and we hear all the time about teachers. Uh, bemoaning the fact that kids can actually read out loud but may have very little idea about what they're reading. So why is that? Well, in order to comprehend, um, there's a lot of things that are going on. So if I am reading along um, and I have a general idea of the topic of what it is that I'm reading about, um, as I read along, I have to, I get pieces of information. And in order for me to put those together and hold them in my mind, that happens, that conscious uh, holding of them in my mind happens in working memory. That's the only conscious processing that I really have. If I encounter then a word or a concept that I don't understand and I have to go ask somebody what it means or I have to look it up or I have to just think about what it might mean, then... Um, uh, and then come back and put that back into what I was reading without having to start all over again, again, that happens in working memory. If I am thinking about what I'm reading and relating it to previous experience, consciously connecting it to what I already know, which is how I actually understand things, I have to relate it to previous knowledge, that also happens in working memory. So working memory is essential. Um, it helps if I can then also visualize it. It helps if I can plan in advance to figure out how I'm going to read something so that I can extract the appropriate information from it. But that, those are just some examples of how important these skills are. So if I don't have adequate working memory, especially if I have decoding problems, if, I'm, if my mental real estate is all used up by trying to um, decode the words that I'm reading, then I'm likely to have very little um, working memory left for, for comprehension. And then the same basic principles are going to apply in math. Um, if I think about um, trying to extract information for charts from charts and graphs, as I would with spatial representations, um, that would be an example of that. Or if I'm trying to visualize the rotation of uh, geometric shape, um, if my spatial skills and directionality are not operating at an automatic level, that's going to be really, really tough. Uh, math requires us to manipulate information all the time. For example, when we have to sort out the elements of a story problem. And today, all of math is a story problem. It, I, and we used to call things story problems and not story problems. We used to solve just plain old equations back in the old days. But today, it's all story problems because it's all about application. It's all about real life, uh, uh, applying things in real life. Um, or think about what happens when you have to, you're solving a multi-step solution, um, keeping track of where you are. And then ultimately, of course, math is very logical. And so reasoning and inference and, and planning um, are all involved there. And of course, what you're hopefully observing is that these some of these same cognitive processes are the same ones that you saw on the chart with reading. So we don't have a math brain and a reading brain. Many of them are the same cognitive processes. So if all of these skills are so integral to the process of reading math that we can't really work around them, then the question of whether we can find a way to strengthen them becomes critically important. And that is what we're going to tackle next. So um, we're going to take a look at some research that I promised to share with you on what training underlying cognitive skills can do. Uh, this is research that was published in Learning Disabilities, a multidisciplinary journal. And if you would like a copy of the published article, that's another thing to add to your list of things to ask me to send to you. Um, this research was uh, conducted by Dr. Sarah Abson. Um, it was part of her doctoral dissertation, this, the research that she conducted. 
Uh, she's currently assistant professor at Damon College in New York, where she directs the master's program in special education. Uh, at the moment, she is actually currently extending her research to students who have been diagnosed with ADHD. And I know that some of the people who signed up for this webinar are also interested in that population. Um, so um, I just wanted to, to mention that. Um, so there's actually a, a strong overlap in the kinds of cognitive deficits um, that we're going to see in this research with those with ADHD, but um, the, the students in this research were not selected for that reason. Um, what they were selected for is the fact that they um, had been diagnosed by their um, schools as having a specific learning disability, so meeting that definition of the IDEA. This was a randomized control trial which means that the students were assigned randomly to the treatment or control condition. Uh, so they were either going about their normal business or they were using the cognitive uh, training intervention. Um, so because they um, had already been diagnosed as having a, a learning disability, they were receiving their standard reading and math interventions to which they were entitled in their school. Uh, these schools were in two elementary schools in New York. Um, so they were receiving their standard curriculum and instruction. Um, in this study, the pre and the post test was the Woodcock-Johnson cognitive battery and some of the Woodcock-Johnson tests of achievement. Uh, the treatment condition involved the use of Brainware Safari, which is a cognitive skills development program uh, that develops 41 cognitive skills. Uh, it's computer-based and um, develops these skills in a very um, comprehensive and integrated manner. So this sort of depicts, uh, for those of you who may not be as familiar with this type of research, um, uh, pretty straightforward, really just shows graphically what I explained on the previous slide. So the students were randomly assigned to the treatment or the control group. The research methodology include looking at the two groups on the pretest to assure that they were comparable cognitively, and then looking at the change over the period of the study, and then looking at the differences at the end. Other than the brainware intervention, students received the same instruction and curriculum from the same teachers at their schools, um, including the, the standard reading and math interventions for students with SLD. Uh, the period of time between the pretest and the post-test was 12 weeks. The protocol for use of uh, brainware was three to five times a week for 30 to 45 minutes per session. So um, the study itself, um, really she wanted to focus on five underlying cognitive skill areas. And these are the um, areas, the subtest areas that can be grouped together um, from the Woodcock-Johnson battery. Um, the areas that she uh, looked at here are listed here, executive functions, visual working memory, verbal working memory, processing speed, and short-term memory. Um, these all play important roles in reading and math, as we saw before. Um, they're also areas that are commonly deficit for students with learning disabilities. So here, here's what we, uh, what she saw in terms of the results. Um, which, one of the things that she did so that she could look at all students um, on an equivalent basis was turn the Woodcock-Johnson scores into something called a relative proficiency index. And all this means is that 90% is the level that is expected of a normally developing student. And of course, these were not normally developing students by definition, um, so we expect them to be performing low. So you can see the first two bars, this um, sort of turquoise bar and the purplish lavenderish bar, were the results of the tests on the pretest. Um, for the control group and the treatment group. You can see that the, the gr both groups um, were performing a little bit above 60% proficiency on the pretest, so quite a bit below 90%, which makes sense. By definition, we know, because these students have SLD, that they have cognitive deficits, and so we expect them to be quite a bit lower performing. Um, Twelve weeks later when they were tested, uh, not much change for the control group. Uh, 
because they weren't receiving a kind of intervention. For the brainware group, um, the average post-test score was 89% proficiency. So a dramatic improvement and virtually scoring almost at that level that would be considered normally developing. Um, also some dramatic changes in reading and math. Not much change, again, in reading or in math for the control group, uh, but you can see getting up um, close to 70 percent uh, proficiency and close to in the mid-70 percent proficiency in reading and in math. Um, she also looked at the scores in terms of um, well, first of all, I need to look at we need to look at the um, as the breakdown in terms of those cognitive processing areas. Um, and this is really um, I find this really, really fascinating because you can see um, in this um, uh, chart that, that how low these students were in some of those areas that we um, have been talking about as being critical in reading and in math. Things like verbal working memory, where these students on the pretest were performing in the 40 to 50, 60 per, uh, percent proficiency range, short term memory in the 60 percent range, uh, broad attention in the 60, mid 60 percent range proficiency, um, executive functions also uh, qu quite low there. Um, but after this cognitive intervention, across the board, getting the students up in the upper 80s and even sometimes, in many cases, above 90% proficiency. So very close to sometimes even surpassing the level that would be considered to be normally developing. So really remediating these cognitive processes that are so integral to um, the academics that they've been struggling with for so long. Now, she also uh, reported uh, the in some in some other ways of looking at the the data, uh, not just um, comparatively on the proficiency index, but actually in growth in months, um, which I think is also quite instructive because we know that the these tests were 12 weeks apart, so basically three months apart. And as you can see here, these are the, the cognitive processes. You can see GIA refers to the general, that's the overall cognitive, that's the combination of all of the cognitive tests, and then the cognitive tests are broken out here. Um, and you can see that it's two to three months, really, for the control group, pretty much a little bit better in auditory. But um, overall, what you see is that the control group improved two to three months over the three months between the tests or pretty much what you'd expect just from maturation, just from uh, being a little bit older, uh, but dramatically more for these um, other, especially in some of these working uh, memory areas where you're seeing multiple months, um, in fact, years really of growth, um, of improvement. Uh, we can also look at it for those of you who are used to seeing things in grade equivalents. Yeah. I'm gonna, I want to let everybody know I'm going to enable public chat now, so the oh, good. chat tab good, good, will good. be available um, if they want to ask any questions or anything like that. Great. I, I do encourage questions. We'll try. We'll um, have. I just have a few more slides before I want to open things up and, and try to answer some questions. Um, so I certainly welcome that and welcome people to uh, to participate in the chat. Um, some people are used to looking at things in terms of grade equivalence, um, so we provided the data in that format as well. Um, and then I just uh, wanted as well to share on the academic side. Uh, these, this is in months, although I think reading and math is sometimes better to look at it as grade equivalence. So over those 12 weeks, uh, and remember that, of course, the, the cognitive, the brainware intervention is not, uh, did not provide any additional instruction in reading or in math. It only involved developing underlying cognitive skills. But because those cognitive skills are so integral to the processes of reading and math, um, we actually see improvement here. So eight tenths of a grade equivalent in reading, a grade, full grade equivalent in math, 
over those 12 weeks. So um, implications, um, what the research suggests, I believe, is that we now have a fourth tool in our toolkit for working with students with learning disabilities. Uh, and we need to add remediation of underlying cognitive skills to modifying the curriculum accommodation and compensatory strategies. Um, and we've been employing all of these um, for, uh, you know, quite some time, but this, this fourth one is one that really is needed in order to help our students reach their full potential. And I see some other implications as well. I think that um, instead of just compensating for weaknesses, we really can um, help remediate those processes. Um, it's not always easy. That there's not. A, I also want to emphasize that there's not a silver bullet. Um, uh, and um, so, you know, it's going to be harder, certainly, for some students. And some cases are a lot more complex than uh, than others. So I don't want to um, make light of that at all. Um, but that when we actually can attack those underlying processes um, and we can increase the function of those weaker cognitive processes, that also decreases the stress associated with learning deficits and the motivational and emotional consequences that come with it. And what you see is this tremendous burden of weight and um, stress that lifts off, and frankly, it works. For, it, it helps teachers as well. I, I've seen um, some pretty um, amazing um, emotional bounce backs from and um, from um, from teachers who work with with students as well. Um, you know, being able to target those underlying processes that are the most closely linked with academic um, problems. Some people refer to it as sort of being able to unpack the um, uh, the academic and really address the, the specifics of why these children are struggling. Um, and then uh, the, the, the other um, implication, I think, is that we have an opportunity before students are even in special education to um, introduce interventions um, early in RTI, um, or bef even in, um, you know, regular classrooms and things, uh, before we expend, um, so much energy and, and, um, uh, so much angst and so much stress, uh, to help a lot of kids who, who just need a little bit of, uh, a little bit of help with some of those underlying processing areas. Um, what we've talked about today is a particular intervention. It's called Brainware Safari. It's a software program. Um, uh, the um, Some people always want to know if it's possible to get the same kinds of outcomes in some other way. Um, the answer is yes, because in truth, Brainware Safari comes from the best practices of multidisciplinary clinical therapy. Uh, it was developed over 40-plus years. Uh, I'm not going to tell you it's easy, and I'm not going to tell you it's inexpensive, but I'm not also not going to tell you it's impossible. Um, I, I'm also going to tell you that some individuals with complex learning disabilities will benefit from other types of interventions. So Brainware is not a, as I said, a silver bullet, um, but it can uh, provide a significant benefit to many, many students with learning disabilities, as you saw in this research. Um, I'm going to tell you what I think some of the, the keys are to effective cognitive training. Um, so if you are in a position to evaluate cognitive training, these are things that you should be looking for. Um, repetition, practice makes permanent and automatic. So unless you are practicing something over and over, um, you're not going to drive it to the level of automaticity. Uh, consistency and precision. The, the, the way that, that these exercises are developed is very, very specific, and they have to be delivered in a very specific and precise way. Um, they get progressively more challenging, uh, and that's, again, there's an art and a science to that so that the, the person who's being trained 
is always in the zone of proximal development, is always being challenged but not over-challenged. There's also an element of what we refer to as smart practice. There's novelty in the unexpected so that it's not repetition to the level of boredom and where your brain turns off, It's but it's in a way that actually uh, trains your brain to do it in a constantly new and different way in, and anticipate that it's always going to have to do it in a new and unexpected um, way. The skills have to be integrated so that they always are going to be working together. And again, that is not a trivial thing uh, to be able to do. The whole program has to inc uh, be able to motivate and engage, providing elements of autonomy so that, um, that, that drive that willingness to continue and persist. Um, feedback and coaching are um, very important aspects of this, and ultimately also the frequency and intensity of training. Um, I always like to say that sort of like going to the gym once a week, it might make you feel a little bit less guilty, but it's not going to do much for your, um, train, your tone or your muscle strength or your flexibility. Um, the, the protocol that was used in the research in this case three to five times a week um, over a period of, about, of 12 weeks is really critical um, to this kind of the effectiveness of this kind of training. So um, this is what it takes to change our brains to the degree that they function and process as differently um, as these students were performing at 60 percent proficiency ultimately changed it to 90 percent proficiency. So um, as we get ready to take some questions, I just want to list some resources that are available. Um, there is a, a very nice report on neuroscience and special education. That's a policy report of the National Association of State Directors. Straight, easy for me to say, State Directors of Special Education. Um, it's available on a um, in, on the federal government website, but um, unless you've got some hours to try to find things there, I'm happy to send you um, a copy of that. There is um, a brand new federal website that you might want to explore and there's a link there. Um, and then some other um, resources, most of which I've referred to. So again, any of the things that, that you are interested in, we're happy to share them um, and make it easy. We're always into making things easy for people to find rather than having to go looking and looking and looking for them. And it's one more thing um, as people get their questions ready. Oh, if they're ready. Oh, they're ready. Okay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this real fast then. Um, if you're interested in Brainware Safari, um, you, ha I ha you, have to, I have to, you have to decide who you are first. So if you're a parent or someone who is interested in using it at home, um, you can use – we have a, pro a special crom promo code that we've set up for people who are attending this um, webinar. And if you, um, until December 22nd, if you, you can get a 50% discount, uh, on your purchase and just use the promo code SLDWeb. And, um, of course, you're going to get a copy of these slides. So if you didn't write it down, you're going to get a copy of the slides. You've got until December 22nd to do that. If you're an educator or clinician, um, we are happy to provide an account for you to explore or evaluate once you've seen the demonstration of the program. And again, you're going to contact me and we're going to figure all that out. So last slide, which has my information on it. And we're going to leave that up while people are asking questions. So you have plenty of time to get my contact information so you can bombard me with emails for all that stuff you want. <laughs> Well, I can tell you, some of them I can roll into one because they, this has been fun watching people go, oh, me too, I want to know that too. That's been great. Um, I'm glad we didn't open up sooner because I would have been typing the entire time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, but the main, the main ones, we only have about five minutes. There's really three main questions. Um, okay. One is, I'll try to do them kind of in order so that those of you that, that want that question can listen, and if you don't want to hear the others, you can do what you need to do. But um, one of the things I want to they want to know is the difference between um, Brainware Safari and specifically Fast Forward and also Play Attention. Okay. 
So fast forward is designed specifically for um, central auditory processing disorder. So it is designed to help um, with issues like phonemic uh, discrimination, phonemic awareness, um, and it does a very, very good job of that. There are also other programs like aerobics, and um, there's another one I heard of the other day that um, one of our clinicians um, uh, swears by learning systems or listening systems or something like that. Um, so it's, it is specifically about um, uh, for helping students who have difficulty distinguishing auditory signals from the background, hearing certain kinds of sounds and those kinds of things. Brainware Safari does not do that. That, um, it does the auditory processing that it's brainware safari is more about integrating audit it's about auditory memory and integrating auditory um, information with other cognitive processes so that's the distinction they're very complementary um, they do not replace each other um, play attention is um, I, I don't know as much about that um, program my recollection is that it is uh, training very specifically f the ability to focus attention skills, exactly. but not but not in a um, so it's focused attention. It's not uh, so the, uh, it's there's, not very integrated. It only does right. It's not in the it doesn't integrate them, and then it also doesn't. So there are two there are two basically systems. One is when you concentrate very hard on something to focus, and the other is sometimes called the default network system, which is when you sort of let, let your attention wander, and we need to be able to use those and go back and forth between them. So the, the ability to go back and forth is not something that I recall that being, um, being trained in that, or the integration with, with memory and visual and auditory and um, some of the other sensory skills. So that would be the difference. And I don't know, uh, frankly, anything about the research that they've done or whether there's evidence of transfer. So that's, that would be one of the questions that I would have that I would um, want to have researched. But. Okay, so the next one um, to ask is, um, there's two that kind of go together. Um, a question about how often someone would need to use the program in order for it to maintain this increased skills and the corresponding question which you're going to know that the, somebody asked is about sustainability. Okay. So here I'm going to say um, it, it depends. <laughs> and <laughs> of course, it doesn't, know, it doesn't that what people always say. So the, in our, in our, in a lot of our research, the, the, um, we have shown that the, Gains that have been made have been sustained even after students stop using the program. And um, that is consistent with what we would expect based on our understanding of how brains develop skills to the level of automaticity. So when something becomes automatic, like when you learn to ride a bike or drive a car or tie your shoelaces, you you do those things all the time and you really don't forget how to do them. If you don't do them for a long time, you don't completely forget how. You may be a little rusty, but it does come back to you. Um, if you're, it's a little bit different for an adult, for example, if they're not in school all the time and using those skills all the time. So I always say, if you're an older adult and are using this to keep your brain active, then it's a different story, and I would tell you that you should keep using it on a regular basis. And I will also say that we don't have as much longitudinal data with students with learning disabilities. Um, in that, in those kinds of situations, there is some suggestion in, and this is more, I have to say this is more anecdotal um, than it is, um, you know, a solid quantitative research, that there is some benefit to having students redo the program again, um, for perhaps later, to take a break and then come back to it and redo it a second time. Um, so that is something that we um, really would really like to explore some more, but there does seem 
um, to be some benefit to uh, ex- re-experiencing it a second a second time with that kind of uh, uh, student. And we're we're out of time, but um, there was also a question about how this applies to ESL, which might be another whole presentation. Um, and another question about if they pa- can pass the recording link on to their colleagues and if those colleagues could also get the discount. Um, yes, anybody, yes. Um, the answer is pretty much yes to everything. That, that's, that's, <laughs> wow. That's, 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 can that's, I get a raise? That's, <laughs> that's the shortcut. So, um, <laughs> The application to ESL, we, we do need to do uh, a separate webinar on uh, cognitive skills and, and um, multiple language uh, because it's English as a second language and it's also English as another language and other languages and it's, it's fascinating stuff. Um, but it is helpful um, and cognitive skills do play a role there for sure. Um, you are welcome to pass on the link. Um, the link, the, the webinar is public, and so the link is public. And anyone who watches this and gets hold of the discount code between now and the 22nd, it is active for anybody who can access it. So that is also um, available. And I think that is probably good enough. There are other questions in there that you might want to address when you pull them, but um, we are okay. pretty much Right. And if so, if, I, if, I, if you have a burning question that I didn't answer, you have my email address, and um, I will do my best to respond. Um, I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope, I hope uh, you found it interesting. Um, I, I enjoyed it. Um, this is a topic that is, I think is just really exciting. I think there's some wonderful things happening. I think we have a, such an opportunity to help our kids in a way we haven't seen before. And um, if I if I don't talk to you, have a fabulous holiday, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you next year. And have a great afternoon. Have a great day, everybody. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you.